Welcome, everyone. Welcome uh, to Aquent Federal webcast. I uh, sincerely apologize for the late start. Totally my fault. We had everything lined up, and I went to remove one slide and ended up removing everything. And as you can imagine, um, we're looking at a lot of graphics today, and it's taken a long time to upload everything, so I do apologize sincerely. I'm very glad you're here with us, and on behalf of Aquent Federal, I um, want to uh, say we appreciate you joining our webcast. It's the second one in the series. And we have a really great guest speaker. Uh, I'll introduce him in just a moment. Um, I think you'll really enjoy his work. My name is Vicki St. Clair, and I'm your moderator. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Aquent, I want to share just a little background. Aquent's been partnering with some of the world's biggest and best brands for more than 25 years. Uh, they're experts in delivering creative marketing and digital solutions and staffing. And Aquent Federal, as the name implies, does exactly the same, but works directly with federal government leaders in creative and digital services. Uh, just as an example, some of Aquent Federal's primary clients include the U.S. Postal Service, the USDA, uh, Health and Human Services, the U.S. Department of Transportation, just to name a few. And you can find out more about Aquent Federal via the website, which we'll give to you at the end of the presentation. And we'll also give you direct contact information so you can actually speak to somebody if you have questions around how Aquent Federal works. And uh, again, I take full personal responsibility for the snafu here. I, I was, uh, I guess I had too much caffeine and I hit the wrong button. But, um, so let's get started. We're going to allow uh, some time at the end of this, the presentation for Q&A, so feel free to enter any questions you have into the chat box as they come up, and, and we'll address them at the end. If you hear a great quote or idea from Michael, our guest, and would like to share it on Twitter, please feel free to use the hashtag AquentFederal. Let me tell you about our guest speaker. Uh, he is Michael Lejeune. He is a creative director with LA Metro. And Metro 30 Person Creative Services Group creates award-winning core communications elements for the nation's third largest transit agency. You can see just a few of the honors they've won right here on this slide. And you can also put a face uh, to Michael's name. Uh, before joining Metro, he was project director at KBDA, the West Los Angeles award-winning design and branding studio. And there he managed projects for Acura, Nike, 3Com, UCLA, and Hilton Hotels, as well as writing for the city of Monterey and uh, some other publications. He's a graduate of the AIGA Harvard's Business Perspectives for Design Leaders program and is currently a co-chair of AIGA's Centennial Committee. And he's joining us today to show how Ellie Metro's Creative Services Group uh, is uh, making transit look cool. Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you, and um, because of our little snafu, my little snafu, uh, I know you have to share your desktop now, so this may take just a moment for this to come in. But Michael, welcome, welcome, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. I hope everybody can hear me. I um, am now uh, sharing my desktop, so let me just, there we go. Whoops. All right. Um, uh, and I have to say, this is a, you know, I love technology. It's challenging, but uh, it's really interesting that we can do this. The only thing I'll preface is that um, I'll miss uh, uh, seeing faces out in the audience and maybe hearing a, a laugh or a reaction or two. So it's it's a little um, more interesting to be talking into a void, but um, hopefully I can communicate um, some of my ideas and some of the things that we've learned here at Metro, and we have a I have a lot of eye candy to share today. Um, so I want to just jump right in. Um, I was really uh, I, I work for a government agency um, or sort of quasi government, and so I really wanted to think about um, how I could offer some ideas that would be helpful to you all um, in the work that you do. I'm going to try to 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 at a at a reasonable pace blaze through. Uh, the slides, so that uh, because I know that um, the Q and A is often the most valuable part of an experience like this for everybody. So I was really trying to think about how um, I could do this. I, I got together with a couple of friends on the beach the other day, and we were just trying to figure out. You know, that's what we do in LA is just to 
hang on the beach. We we're trying to figure out what to do. And one of my friends, the woman with the big blonde hair who's just below me in the, in the snapshot that we took, um, said, you know, start with a little bit of context about what you all do at Metro and, and where you've come from. So um, I, I think that's helpful. Thank you, Pam, uh, for that suggestion. I think it's helpful because uh, it's hard to understand the work that we do, I think, without understanding where we came from. L.A., uh, here you're seeing a slide of um, Union Station, our beautiful and historic railroad station um, back in the early years of its existence in the 1940s. And this is sort of an idea of, you know, the ideal of L.A., but this is actually what Union Station still looks like today, and I work in a tower that's just behind that beautiful red tile roof. Um, this was one of the last of the great railway stations in, um, along the um, stretch of the United States built by the Union Pacific Company. And it's where everybody came into Los Angeles before airline service and before, you know, long distance, well, there were but long distance buses, but um, rail service across the country was really great and people would come into this beautiful station and there would be orange trees and orange blossoms and palms moving in the wind. And, and I, I think it's fair to say that people thought they had landed at heaven on earth, um, which is why we have a very populated county today. Um, we actually had, Los Angeles uh, is a bit of an oxymoron in that, in that in the 30s and 40s, 50s, we had one of the best public transportation systems in the country. What you're seeing now is a red line car. We had these amazing trolleys that traversed all of Southern California, um, uh, and they were really a, a wonder. You could go from the top of the San Gabriel Mountains down on a red line car all the way down into the basin of Los Angeles and out to the Pacific Ocean uh, without getting out of your seat. It was really something and um, was uh, sort of the envy of the nation. Um, but what happened after World War II is that um, the way Americans wanted to live, and particularly the way Californians wanted to live, changed. And uh, folks came back from serving in the war, and there was a great deal of prosperity, and uh, Southern California was starting to build our interconnected freeway system. Uh, and so what people were really after was a lifestyle that looked something like this. This is an advertisement from, from sometime in the 50s. Uh, I love this because it, it, it's just such an interesting idea about how the way people in Los Angeles live. We all have this incredibly modern house with glowing lights that overlooks the ocean. And of course, we have two convertibles, not one. And everybody entertains in a, a white dinner jacket and formal dress. So this was the beginning of this idea of pushing out that you know you could live in luxury and have your own car. Uh, car culture was born in Los Angeles. Um, the, the movie American Graffiti was based on the idea of cruising um, in the valley. And it uh, you know we really were the center of uh, car culture and this idea that you know you could whiz everywhere freely um, in your own vehicle. Um, here's another here's another ad from the oh probably 60s. I won't explain the subtextual meaning of this advertisement. Um, you can call me uh, offline and I'd be happy to elucidate that for you. But you know this is the idea that was being pushed out there was that uh, cars were power, cars were desirable, everybody should have one, you could live in the suburbs and zoom into your job and downtown, that sort of thing. Even today, um, this idea of, you know, uh, zooming around L.A. and not, not being, you know, um, mired in, in traffic is still prevalent. This is the $100,000, probably more than that now, Tesla convertible, you know, and of course the guy's happy and he's zooming, zooming along the, the streets at night, you know, he's not emitting and he just feels great. So that's a really nice um, fantasy. But in fact, uh, the reality in Los Angeles is really more like this. This, I might add, is an unretouched photo of the <laughs> Santa Monica Freeway. And in fact, that was my commute for probably 10, 12 years. Um, for all I know, one of those cars uh, have, facing you it was me uh, at, at, that, at that awful moment. But this is what I did for a, a long time and so I, I, I sort of look at my job as this somehow this kind of karmic uh, award for for you know gritting my teeth and muscling through traffic every day. Um, so we're very proud of our traffic in a way in LA. In fact, uh, the Texas Transportation Institute um, does a survey 
each year uh, looks at a number of data points about congestion, traffic, people's commute habits, jobs, how long it takes to get to jobs, and they award um, one city in, in, uh, in the United States uh, an award for the worst congestion in the nation. And Los Angeles has been so proud to win that award not once, uh, not twice, not five times, but in fact 25 years in a row. Um, uh, so, you know, we claim our place. However, I do have some good news, which is that uh, uh, about two years ago, the, um, the paradigm shift and Chicago was named the worst traffic in the nation. And so we happily relinquished that crown and we're well on our way to, um, to, to fixing that. In fact, a, a study that came out last year found that Los Angeles had one of the most connected transit systems for commuting in the country. I think we ranked third. So we've kind of flipped ourselves around in a relatively short period of time and there's a lot of excitement here about really getting to our problems. So th the basic question for us at Metro is how do we go from this, which is a reality for so many people, uh, whether or not you're commuting to work or happen to be just trying to get across town or, or, or a visitor, uh, how do we go from this to something that is a little more like this? Uh, there are going to be a couple of slides, by the way, that are going to have some funky color. I apologize for that. Um, they, they, something got lost in our translation to um, to a format that would work here uh, on the call. But in any case, this was one of the first ads that we shot. And it, it, you know, it's the idea of picking up on a popular um, cultural theme at the time, which was Lucha Libre wrestling. But it's this idea that everybody goes metro to work and that um, you know, you're making a smart, almost heroic choice by getting out of your car and backing away slowly and, and uh, choosing something else for your life. So I, I want to jump into a couple of um, ideas uh, or maybe pieces of advice that I would give you. Um, and the first one I'm calling Nuke the Bell. Uh, I know it can be difficult in a government agency, uh, even more so than in a groovy design firm with polished steel and, you know, um, frosted glass dividers and, you know, uh, a, a cappuccino machine. We don't necessarily have those luxuries um, uh, in, in government work. But I think that the, the core of what we can do can really be achieved and we can treat ourselves as if we worked for that, for that you know, hip award-winning design firm. But um, it really starts with our own attitudes and the way we look at our work. When I started at Metro on the first day, and I, and I was hired as the first creative director, so I didn't have any, any sort of uh, preconceived handoff of here's the way we do it. I just came into a situation with a couple of designers that were working here in very relative obscurity at that point. And I came into the uh, space that is our design studio now. It was at that point called Graphics. Um, and there was a little plaque on the wall right outside the door that said graphics. Um, and I took note of that on my first walk down the hallway. I came into the space, and the first thing I saw was a counter. And on that counter was this bell. Uh, this is not the actual bell, but it was exactly like this one, the kind of thing you'd ring at a meat market or, um, you know, um, maybe even uh, at another government agency like the DMV or something where you were wanting to get uh, attention. Um, and when people would uh, need help from the graphics department, they would come in and stand at the counter and ring the bell. And then whatever designer was not in the middle of saving a file or working would, would sort of saunter up and say, how can I help you? And the person would say, I, I need to um, create a brochure on X subject or Y subject. Here's my floppy disk. And they would literally hand somebody a floppy disk, if you remember those. Uh, and it would have a you know Microsoft Word uh, like you know 1942 version file on it or something, and maybe a, a, a photo file of some kind. And they'd say, and here's you know the copy is in there, and there's this photo, and and I want to have this thing uh, designed and printed. And I like the color uh, red, so could you please use red? And ding, they would ring the bell and walk out, and you know two weeks later or so would come back and and uh, some sort of graphic design had been produced uh, as they, they would then take that downstairs to our print shop. We um, got rid of the bell, we got rid of the counter, we uh, renamed the department the design studio, and we set about looking for a different way to work. Um, and we've completely transformed the way we work, and not only transformed the way we work, but through that work, we've transformed our value 
in our agency to the point where um, not much happens here. And we are a very large agency with our fingers in many, many, many pies in Los Angeles at this point. Not much happens here without us touching it. And we're generally the final touch on any piece of communication of any kind. You'll see a lot of variety of work as we go through here. Um, so we nuked the bell. Uh, we set about taking all of these functions you see here, these small orange dots, were all the parts of um, Metro that were communicating somehow, from publications to printing to past sales, uh, cross promotions, customer centers, public art, all of these and all their little um, separate budgets and, and silos and fiefdoms, we brought them all together um, under the guise of a, a new and much more robust communications group and our chief communications officer at the time who was also relatively new to uh, Metro but had, had been born and raised in Los Angeles after going out, before going elsewhere. He brought it all back in and said, we're going to be a full-service agency that does everything ourselves. So these dots were very important because they each had a dollar figure attached to them and a function. We brought them all together uh, and started in with the work of, of doing um, all of this under one um, sort of happy family. We had this picture taken a couple of years ago of the whole group. This is not all of our communications group. That's actually about 300 people, including our uh, customer service telephone operators and people out in the different customer centers in the field, um, but you know this is what this is what the group, uh, the core group that works in our headquarters building looks like. We run um, jobs in much the same way other ad agencies do. Everything starts. Here's one of my funky pink slides, so excuse me. Um, we run things. Uh, everything gets assigned a job request form. We do still use paper um, for a brief moment in time. Um, our jobs are entered in, uh, and we have three. We have a production meeting three days a week where we sit down with our um, sisters and brothers in the marketing group, the account executives, and go over every active job we have. That job list generally runs about 200 or so jobs at any given time. Um, each of them has what we call a green sheet. If you if you were seeing the full color of this, the, the sheets would be green. And we attach things, and we open up a job and talk about it, and then it all gets digitized and goes into our uh, FileMaker database. Um, we believe very much, again, a pink slide, but um, we believe very much in using, uh, you know, found materials, pinups, the kind of stuff that can't really be replaced digitally. And that we look at things online, but then we there, nothing beats building that, you know, war room wall and looking at sort of getting inspiration to start out with. We do a lot of pinup. One of the things that we did when we remade our space in that first year was we took every available large wall space and covered it with corkboard. And um, we pin and unpin and pin and unpin and pin and unpin um, to, our, to our heart's uh, you know, delight in trying to jumpstart ideas. Um, unfortunately, not seeing what I'm looking at here uh, in this slide, but uh, this is a whole bunch of different kinds of language. Here's, here's the next one that looks a little better. We, um, we write. We mark up, we work, um, and we just tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak because nothing can really beat um, iteration for getting to the right idea. Um, and this is one of our cork walls. This is all the material that we actually did produce for the 75th anniversary of Union Station. You're seeing some video screens in here. You're seeing large-scale banners. You're seeing um, printed material online material, um, T-shirts and wearables, uh, just about everything that we could think of to celebrate. So this is, this is how we keep track of all that we do. And we use our space, you know, we don't have, again, that luxury of a highly designed space with uh, the latest, you know, um, knoll furniture and that sort of thing. So we just mess it up. We just put stuff everywhere um, and, and, and use our, our space as a kind of constantly um, changing laboratory. Um, you know, here's some of the pieces from Union Station as they actually realized we did a beautiful book um, to celebrate the 75 years of the station, which Metro owns and manages now. Um, we use large-scale graphics uh, at our other rail stations to get people uh, to, uh, excited about the year of celebration. Uh, we even translated that to a cake for the uh, 100th or 75th anniversary uh, public event that, that brought in about 40,000, 50,000 people to Union Station. So we, um, 
we start with the wall and we end up with um, a, a confection sometimes or a shirt or a movie or uh, public information, anything that, that needs to be done. Um, it, my second point that I wanted to make is that no matter what your uh, agency, whether you're working for the IRS or a transportation agency or anything in between, um, you really need to find your voice. There is a voice to every company, every service, every function of society in a way, um, you know, whether you're working for profit or not. And um, I, I think that it's really important to find that voice through a lot of talk, exploration, um, you know, focus groups can be helpful really talking to your customers and deciding what what your agency wants to be. Your agency may have been in business for many, many years um, and may be, you know, as we were, mired in negative public perception and uh, not that much trust in what the, what the former MTA was doing with, with public dollars. But you can help to right that ship once you understand what your voice would be. Um, this is the first... Um, piece that I worked on. It was a what we call a take one, a printed piece that, that fits in you know, the kind of take run rack that you'll find in many buses and trains, but also sometimes they're on counters at hotel lobbies and, and places of business. This is kind of our standard size. And um, we, uh, this was one of those pieces that came in and somebody was probably looking for the bell, which they could no longer ring, but they sat down and said, we want to revise this. And uh, we sat with them and said, okay, what, what's, what, what, tell us where we want to go with this or what your, what your need is. And this is a very important piece because we're recruiting bus operators or potential bus operators. Um, that's our workforce. If we don't have enough of them, we don't have enough um, operators to drive the buses and trains. So keeping enough of those um, trainees in the hopper is very important, and we're constantly recruiting for bus operators. And the client said, oh, it's really fine. Uh, we just want to change the photo on the front from this African-American woman to a Chinese-American uh, male operator. Here's the photo on the floppy disk. And we want to change that dollar figure. It's up a little bit from $18.41, but it's fine otherwise. And I thought, hmm, I don't, this wouldn't excite me necessarily. I think maybe there's another way to, we could explore to do this that might be a little more engaging. And... Uh, I said, hey, hey, Matt, who was our chief communications officer, what do you think? Should we jump in with this one? And he said, go for it. You have three days, basically. Um, we, have, we have purchase media already set, and uh, you'll, you'll need to have stuff um, going out for production in about three days, but go for it. And so we jumped right in, and this is actually one of the first pieces we did, which was a, 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 what they call a king ad, an ad that goes on the sides of our buses. Um, you know, a different way of presenting the idea um, of driving a metro bus. Here's another one. Um, this kind of conversational tone and offering up, you know, a, a thought in a very simple format. This is really not about design. We hadn't even done rebranding work, logo work, anything yet. But this was really the first piece that went out. And it kind of established a voice for metro that we have continued on. Here's another piece that we did shortly after that, um, which was about taking care of our own system and um, encouraging people to clean up and, and, and not, you know, not scratch at our buses and uh, seats, not, not drop trash. Um, you know, we had a graffiti issue um, and, and some vandalism issues that we're really trying to, to present in a different way to people, which is sort of like, let's all, let's all work together on this. Um, and yes, then we did the branding work. That, that needed to be done to kind of reintroduce ourselves. We, we set about um, working our, our designs down to just two typefaces that were very carefully considered. We renamed uh, our service, um, uh, our bus service to be in three different um, striations, local, rapid, and express service, and started thinking about other service, what we call our, um, our metro liner buses, our rail system, and just kind of got some of our you know, housekeeping items in order. And that's important work, but really we wanted to get back right after that um, internal work to the voice again. And we felt like it was time with a new logo and, um, and a new way of speaking that we could reintroduce ourselves. Um, sorry, that slide did not come through either, so I'm going to go right on to the next. This is one of my favorite um, pieces that we did early on. We were introducing the idea of Metro as um, a service name for the agency rather than the former 
long, long name that we have, which is technically the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, commonly known uh, as it is in New York as the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And so we we whipped up this billboard, and I love this because we got a number of calls to our customer centers, people saying, you know, you really need to get your money back. Have you seen what, what the Viacom did to that billboard? It, it's, it's a mistake, and I love that because we actually intended it that way. Um, I can't, you can't see that slide very well, but this is our former bus, um, our, what our buses looked like before. They were white, um, not this white, of course, but they were white and um, really blended in with most other, though they were larger than other vehicles. You know, white to us seemed like, well, gee, why would you bend it, blend in with delivery vans and, you know, rented trucks and um, uh, uh, vans that you don't even know what they're doing on the road and, you know, kind of the, the kind of blend in the landscape rather than jump out. And we discovered that we uh, had a paint shop. This is this is a lesson about both understanding your voice, but also understanding your resources. It turned out that right across the street um, from the Metro headquarters building where we were uh, was a big facility where our buses came in to get um, repainted when they had had maybe a little fender bender or um, had gone about halfway through their overall life and they got painted. We discovered through talking with the paint shop people and, and, and the operations people that, gee, we could, we could um, come up with new colors for the buses. Uh, and, and, and we worked that so it wouldn't cost much more. And so we completely changed the look of our buses, which are the primary um, primary uh, touch point for about three-quarters of our customers every day. That's about uh, 800,000 people a day, um, actually more like a million now. Um, and we came up with this bright California poppy color for the locals, and we, and we painted silver and, uh, uh, on top and bottom and went for big... Big branding. This is what one of our um, Metro Rapid buses looks like. They're just incredibly juicy and bright. You see them all over Los Angeles now, crisscrossing streets, and it's a really fun feeling to look up a, a, a big LA corridor like Wilshire Boulevard, Ventura Boulevard, um, and see you know three or four of them in the distance coming towards you. It's also really helpful for, for customers to see that bright color now because they can see where their bus is and they know it's on the way. Um, and so we sort of took these candy colors um, and made the buses feel like giant toys. And what resulted was that Matchbox and Mattel decided, oh, we like those. We're going we're gonna, to um, make those into uh, Matchbox cars. And so uh, Metro is the first agency, and I think the only in the country, to actually have its own set of Metro Rapid and Metro Local Matchbox cars. Um, so that became our voice, something that you could buy at Target and Toys R Us. Um, we use photography... Uh, all the time, we shoot most of it ourselves, uh, or or use you know uh, favored photographers that we like um, who get the idea of the voice. And this is just uh, one of the shots we shot for an ad. The idea of what it really feels like to sit in traffic and how that you know, I, I think this hopefully speaks for itself. We we use photography to promote ways that you can use Metro. So here's Hollywood and Vine, one of the most famous and very popular tourist attraction corners in LA. But um, you know, we just turn the lens around and uh, and present the idea um, of what it might feel like to be uh, going out in LA at night, but through you know looking out from a from a metro bus and and having that be your ride instead. We um, we are boosters for all the different neighborhoods in Los Angeles. This is six of a series of now uh, at last count about 45 different neighborhood posters that local artists do. They, they come up with the concept, the medium, and, and what part of LA they want to represent, and they, and they uh, submit that to us, and we have a, a panel of um, practicing artists who selects these, and we publish about six of them a year. So we become uh, sort of tour guides as well for how you can get to different parts of um, LA and enjoy you know, LA is not one place like most cities. It's many, many neighborhoods, and this is our way of promoting that uh, on our bus and rail system and through advertising. Um, and we don't forget about a, a core part of our audience. You really need to know yourself, but you need to know your audience as well. And um, you know, we don't, we can't forget about the people who are driving in cars. But we can encourage carpools through an idea that it's a little more fun, a little more lively, and certainly more sensible to share the ride. Um, again, I'm just going to kind of go through some of our. Um, some of our past 
um, presentations of ideas. We like to use, you know, common language and vernacular um, when presenting ideas. Um, we are into technology. Uh, so this this is a comp that we did to test our QR codes, which we use all the time now. And just this idea of, again, we're in a dialogue with all of our customers and with all of Los Angeles County, really. Here's another example of that that you'll find sometimes at our rail stations. You know, we sometimes have to um, acknowledge uh, security issues or the fact that, yes, you are being filmed, but this is LA and you look fantastic. So uh, we, we try to have a little fun with our information. We are always presenting information, um, and I think you can share that. I, you can share that thought as, as government entities. Always presenting information, and the information has to be clear and understandable. But that doesn't mean that it has to be off-putting or, um, you know, kind of unattractive or um, not not intriguing in its presentation. Um, and we're very much in the community. We're very much about um, participating. This is the um, the Los Angeles West Hollywood. Um, pride parade that happens every year, and we do a banner that that, that runs in front of our um, in front of a bus that that's in the parade, and we and some of our employees go out and participate. We love that feeling of being in the community in a different way than just um, you know picking people up and, and getting them on their way. Uh, my second thought to you, is, or third thought, excuse me, is sometimes it's helpful to do what 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 my wife, who's an executive recruiter, calls opening the kimono, and what that really means is. You know, sharing a little bit of what's uh, of your process um, with with selective audiences. Um, in this case, we had launched a new ad campaign. I'm going to show you a couple of them here. Um, this is a billboard we did um, promoting the idea, very simply, that Metro is the agency of more, which is very much where we are right now. We're we're, we're well funded, and we've got a lot of projects on the on the on the design board and four or five um, active transportation projects in construction as well as many highway projects. So we are the agency of more at a time when most most government services are, 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 are less, unfortunately. And so we wanted to, we came up with this series of, of uh, ways to promote the idea of more, but it's always paired with something, in this case, more lanes like the express lane service that we have open, um, more savings and uh, this idea that you're going to, you know, that you're going to need to bring the piggy bank with you because, uh, you know, that you're going to save so much money riding metro instead of driving, or even that you're going to need a great big piggy bank and you can take care of that like your own car. Um, this was another billboard. So we'd done the series and it was out, but we thought, you know, what we want to do is really share the process with our own internal people. All the models you're seeing in these ads are metro employees, um, and we've had a lot of fun with that over the years. But we thought. Um, we're always in a we're always in a competition for funding and increasing our funding internally through the budget process, which never seems to end. And what about the idea that we would share um, share our um, our service with uh, or our, our process with others so that they can see what's happening? And Vicky, at this point, um, if you could put in the first video, let's hope this works. It's the um, it, it'll be the BTS behind the scenes video. Okay, and Michael, I'll need you just to back out of your desktop to do that. I just checked well, on that. Uh, and uh, I, I just want to apologize again to everyone for the quality of some of the graphics. Michael's work is, I mean, he's known for outstanding, stellar colors, great bold colors, and we're not seeing them as we, as we should. But um, Okay, so I've got the video here. And you should be able to see that right now. Did you build this? Yeah. I'm so scared of you right now. Half <laughs> shut up.
so we're back to you. I think, I think one of the questions at the end is going to be, how do you get to work at uh, LA Metro? You look as though you have too much fun. <laughs> and we're at 10 for <laughs> You know, it's interesting because um, that really was part of the idea, and I'm getting back to slideshow here, um, was, uh, oh dear, okay, let me get through this rather quickly, sorry. I went back to the beginning, didn't mean to do that. Um, we really wanted to share with people because we want them to understand, first of all, what goes into that. You know, that was a cast of, of, of many people and all of them employees. We, we, you know, as I, as I mentioned, um, let's see here. We, we, we wanted to uh, make the case that the funding that we use is very uh, important to us and, um, and we need more of it to be able to do this kind of work. But also that helps us in recruiting people, and it just helps. It, it sort of puts that fun spirit out there so that others can see it. Um, and, and we found that to be kind of helpful. Um, the next point I want to make is that you know there will be a regular workflow, I'm sure, for everybody that works um, in the kinds of agencies that that we're that we're talking about. Um, and it'll come to you. You know that's part of being in house is that you don't go out and necessarily have to win business and win that big million dollar contract, that kind of stuff just comes, uh, sometimes it comes to you, sometimes it feels like it comes at you. But um, if you want to do the kind of work that you want to do, a lot of times you have to ask for it. You have to go and figure out what it is that people um, are doing elsewhere in your agency that may not be coming to you. you know, that, um, we have an actual policy, board mandated policy that all external communications need to run through communications and a lot of them through the design studio. That doesn't mean they all do. There are always people who have their own budgets, want to hire their own consultants, want to sort of you know, um, drive that and sort of be their own creative director. But that's not necessarily what's, what's best for the agency and communication as a whole. So we have really learned to ask for it and keep our ear to the ground. A quick story here is um, a book called The Long Range Transportation Plan. This is kind of the uh, government mandated 25 year vision document for um, all transportation agencies and all cities have to do these and it basically is a big um, budget book that's combined with a vision and says here's how we're going to spend our budget over the next 20 years or so 25 years this is what it looked like inside um, uh, and I will I won't comment on design because that's really not exactly the point but it was uh, pretty dense and pretty hard to get through um, and the woman who was in charge of this called me up not long after I'd started, uh, about a year or so in, and said, hey, um, this is Heather. Um, I'm in the planning department, um, and I hear you're the new graphics guy. Uh, and I said, yes. And she said, I, I wondered if you have a minute to come up and talk with me. I want to ask you a graphics question. And I said, sure. Uh, so I went up to um, the planning floor, about four floors above, and met Heather for the first time. She showed me this book. She showed me the cover. Uh, she showed me, you know, a couple of pages and said, "Here's my question. Um, we already have our design firm in place, and the PO has been done, and they're funded, and we're ready to go. We're updating the book um, as we do every five years with a couple of changeouts. But my question is this: Last time we did this with three columns of type on a page, and I'm wondering what you think about the idea of doing two columns of type on a page." Um, you can imagine how honored I was to be asked <laughs> such a weighty <laughs> question. And I paused for a minute and I said, well, Heather, what is this document? Can you tell me about it? And thus ensued about an hour-long conversation that had nothing to do with three columns of type or two. I asked a lot of questions. And what I came to know at the end of this hour was that this is probably one of the most important pieces that Metro puts out there. It's seen by every government official. It's seen by concerned groups. It's seen by people and read by people or not read by people, as, as the case may be, who really want to know what Metro is going to do over the next two or three decades. And I said, how about you let us take a crack at this? Oh, my goodness, no, I couldn't do that because, you know, as I said, we've got this firm in place and we were just about to hand them files. And I said, well, why don't you give us, if you would, give us two weeks. Um, we'll work up a presentation. We'll give you a couple of directions. You can come down to the design studio to our conference room, and we'll we'll give you a presentation to see if you think it might work um, to tell the story in a different way. Because what I think, Heather, is that there is a big story here, and it's not necessarily being told in the most um, alluring, uh, you know, way. 
And so she reluctantly agreed, reminding me of the deadlines all the time. And we worked up some directions. And here's what happened. Um, you can imagine a happy ending, because why would I include this story if there wasn't one? We went from this to uh, a cover that looks like this. Um, and uh, pages that, you know, a, a simple flip through that tells the story of, um, you know, what, what Los Angeles wants and needs from us, not what we are going to do. So that is, information is in there, but we really switched the voice and made it about um, first person and made it about issues like quality of life and a better commute. Um, you know, sure, we had to have the tables and the charts and the pie charts and all of that, but we reworked everything. We put in all new photography, um, and we rewrote much of the top-level messaging. Um, you know, and we thought to ourselves, wow, we're an agency that actually can say we're creating a better world, so let's say we're creating a better world. Um, and this is the direction that they, that they quote-unquote bought, um, and this is now in its uh, third printing. Um, and uh, the happy news is that um, when we started and I sat down with Heather, she had about 4,000 leftover copies of the long-range plan in boxes in the basement that had never been distributed because there wasn't really much demand. We printed about 10,000 of this, and they all went um, out the door. And we had something like 25,000 views of the PDF on the website. So the audience level increased exponentially because there was a story that we were telling and a way to tell it that seemed um, more enticing. Um, my, my next uh, thought is for whatever you do, whatever your message or bucket of messages, which can in government agencies be somewhat complicated, lose all of that government speak, lose the acronyms, wipe the slate if you can, or wipe it as clean as you can, and start with the simple idea of being clear and being bold and being flexible. Case in point, um, this is a cover of the LA Times. Um, from you know 2007 when we found that um, we were losing a lot of um, our state funding um, through um, the fact that that money was being taken and putting being put elsewhere and we were not in control of our uh, of our ability to deliver because there was a quote unquote fiscal crisis in California and uh, the governor at the time Arnold Schwarzenegger was taking money that was meant to go to transportation projects and. Um, you know, new programs and literally employing people on construction projects and took that money and put it into the state fund to try to, to try to stem the flow of the general crisis. That has a real effect on uh, whether we can deliver services and, and get new rail lines going and new projects going. So we, we need to kind of control our own ship. And um, we sat down and thought, how can we communicate this idea um, that, you know, Metro really is a solution. And I sat with Matt, our chief communications officer, and he said, you know, we have to, we have to paint Metro as a solution. And I said, well, what's the problem? And uh, he said, well, it can't be that you drive alone because that would be kind of um, demonizing, you know, uh, most of our customers who do drive alone each day. But it can be about high gas prices. It can be about, you know, um, traffic. It can be about congestion or pollution. That can be the problem, and we can be the solution. And we realized that there was a nice opposite there. And so we went for, um, through a lot of iteration, a lot of development, we came up with a campaign that probably was the most simple campaign we've ever done. Uh, it was unheard of for us to put something out there with two words, but um, we did. We even uncoupled our logo to, because we knew that there was enough recognition of the M um, and that people felt it, it, it meant Metro. And so we just came up with something that was so boiled down and so distilled um, that it became somewhat memorable to uh, to the general public and was easy to look at and uh, you know maybe had a little bit of humor to it. Of course, you can never underestimate the value of a good T-shirt, especially on a child. So uh, during the life of that campaign, which lasted about a year, uh, come the holidays, we put together a naughty, nice T-shirt. And here's a little tip. You can distribute your work um, in new and thoughtful ways that are unexpected. We took these T-shirts and we didn't sell them. We distributed them um, to kind of influencers and thought leaders around Los Angeles. And one of my colleagues had recently read that there was a, a chain of coffee shops um, called Intelligentsia, and one of them in, um, in Silver Lake, which is a sort of epicenter of hip in Los Angeles, um, had been voted the best baristas in Los Angeles by uh, LA Weekly, one of our newspapers. And so we sent a bunch of uh, shirts over to them, and look what happened. 
they wore them while they were um, brewing your five dollar, you know, um, half soy, half, half and half decaf cappuccino, and that's you know that's the kind of brand awareness and third party endorsement that you can't buy. You just have to, um, you know, uh, do that. We were later asked then to um, to um, to make a commercial that was based on this idea of the opposites and the very bold thing. And so, Vic, I'm going to ask you to play now the second um, video here. Uh, let me go okay. back to you guys. I'll turn this back to the desktop. Um, and that will be the traffic uh, video. Let's see, where's my... Um, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Traffic every day. Sig alerts, men at work, backside hurts. Traffic, money down the drain. Bitter baby, stop, go, stop. Vessels in my mind go pop. Metro sweet. From here till infinity. The answer? Metro. 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 One of the reasons why I'm suggesting that you've got to be flexible is because um, you never know where um, where you're going to where an idea is going to come from or how you're going to have to do something. In the case of those TV spots, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I have to run through these again. In the case of those TV spots, um, we were handed the production team, we were handed the stars that that needed to be in that spot because we had been able to make a really great deal because they were promoting an idea for a screenplay that they were trying to get going in a studio. And so, you know, one of them was uh, Terry Crews, who at that time was not that well known, but is now a pretty big star. And we just kind of worked with that and, and kept thinking about ways that we could um, incorporate that idea into uh, something that was simple and watchable. And we did about six of those spots in one day's one day of shooting. Um, and they turned out to be so kind of off the wall that our uh, chief communication officer at the time didn't even show them to the CEO. He just put them on the air because we weren't really sure, you know, how that was going to go. Sorry. Oh, I could have played them in the video. Sorry. Okay. Um, Michael, I just uh, sorry to interrupt you here, but we have six minutes uh, okay. left, and I know. Uh, until the end of the hour, and I know we did start a little late, but I'm assuming that some people will have to drop, um, you know, at 11. So okay. I don't know if you want to, um, you know, highlight a couple of things. I'll leave it up to uh, you. I'm so. going to just go to the last, um, the last bit here. Sorry that we did run out of time. Um, and my last idea, and we'll skip that last um, piece, or we'll let it play if you want to watch it. Um, the last thing I would say to government groups is you really need to think about currying favor. You need to know who within your agency are, are change agents of their own, who might control purse strings, who might, um, who might be able to really help you to do the best work, and who have, let's say, the largest canvas. I don't mean to say that you're not going to service everybody with a smile and, and do your best work for small and large projects, but, you know, um, the large canvas that exists with some of your clients is the way that the agency as a whole or the idea uh, of your service or whatever you're offering to the public as a whole is going to be uh, is going to get out there in the best way. In our case, um, one of our projects was uh, Express Lanes, which is a, which is a new service um, in Los Angeles. It's a toll road service, and we really wanted to put together some great advertising for them because it was such a big new thing and was going to be the way freeways work in Los Angeles from here on in. So we really went all in in terms of creating these, uh, these – we shot these ads ourselves, we cast them with people uh, from the agency, and we put those out there. And it turned out that the woman who was the head of that program was so happy with this that when she became the head of procurement – and I hope you all know what I mean when I say procurement, that is buying services for the agency as a whole um, – we knew that we wanted to hold on to her as a really – important client for us. And so we developed a whole set of elements for the rebranding of procurement. Um, and here are just a couple of them. This CIMS is what they call their service. But really, um, we wanted to make sure that she was continuing to be particularly well loved by the, by the communications group because she <coughs> excuse me, was so important to what we do. Um, 
I want to have Vicki play one last video for you, and here's the idea that will that will close out the show um, for us before questions, if we can have any. And that is, sometimes you let others do the work for you. So, Vicki, um, pause that for just well. Let's run it. Okay, great. We wanted to hand over the keys. This is Los Angeles. We have filmmakers, we have creative people, and what we did was say run a video contest on our website and say what what do you love about writing Metro? What can you you know, put together a one-minute video that shows how you use Metro, and we'll have a contest. We'll have judges. We'll see, we'll put them all on the website. This is the winning one, and I'll just let it run and then talk for just a quick second about about the results. You can unpause that now, Vicky. I think you can see that that would have cost us a million dollars in a way and taken us six months to do. And it's such a lovely story, but it's also really, uh, it's filmed on our system. It's, it's, uh, it is people riding. It's kind of the best possible scenario for taking public transportation. And we just love it. And if you can get into the idea um, that, that people may be able to celebrate your brand with you with a slight bit of, you know, um, uh, of leeway, some some marvelous things can happen. Um, and I'll just add that the woman uh, Faye Grant, who or Faye Kingsley, who who directed, wrote, and shot that video, and she's also the woman and the, the actor in the video. Um, we hired her, and we had her do a couple videos for us as a result. So you never know where that great idea is going to come from, and sometimes it doesn't come from behind your closed doors. It comes from the world out there. Um, that's my last bit. I, again, thanks for hanging through with uh, some of the some of the glitches, um, and I'd love if anybody has questions to to be able to do that now. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, if anybody has to drop, we totally understand. Um, we did start late, and apologies uh, for that, uh, and apologies again for the graphic quality on some of those images. But we do have a couple of questions here, Michael, and um, I think one of the one of the most common thoughts is how often you have to compete against external agencies. Does that, does that happen a lot? It happened all the time when we started in that um, people already had their own relationships and they had their own budgets. They, they may not have been strictly following you know, the, the guidelines, if you will, but they, were, they weren't because we didn't have the offerings that we do now. We, so we used to compete. You know, we used to get... Um, we used to see product coming in like videos and, and um, actually full-blown communications campaigns from outside agencies for, for big parts of what we do. And at first that was discouraging, and then we realized, you know what? We just have to do that kind of work better. We have to become 
the creative group that people want to work with and that they would work with instead of an outside agency. And we also communicated whenever we had good work, we, we would try to put it out there and make sure that we had people, if you will, talking us up. But we also let people know, you know, you don't have to spend your budget on that. We're relatively free. Um, you don't have to pay us in the same way that you use that budget. And wouldn't that be great to, to allocate your your money elsewhere and get a better result? Um, and then there was a kind of a transitional period where we found that people knew us well enough and the, and the work that we could do where they would bring us something to fix. Um, and that's tricky because sometimes things have, are, so, are so far along in the process that you can't fix them or you can't, you can't fix them to the best way you know you want to. And now what happens is that we're in that first meeting. We are, we're, we're a call that people make through their account executive and they say, we want to get together with you. We're just starting this project, and we want to talk about what it could be and how we could communicate it. And we love that because that's like a complete 180 from where we started, where we weren't even knowing about communications projects, to we're in that first meeting at the table thinking with them about how to structure it. Right. And so from an employee perspective, you know, from your team's perspective, how different is it to work inside the government than working with an outside agency? Because I know you've had a ton of outside agency experience, and you know that can be very frenetic, and they can pull all-nighters. Do you have the same kind of experience? No, <laughs> happily. Um, we, we kind of have the best of both worlds, and, and, I, and I credit us for constructing the feel, the liveliness, the ability to do work that you, know, you would do at that agency outside uh, you know, for pay. But we also have job security. We have really great benefits. We, you know, we don't work late hours. Um, we work intensely and creatively and collaboratively while we're here, and then we go home. Um, so we've sort of sloughed off the madness that can happen in a for-profit situation, but kept the the juice, if you will, the energy and the creativity. Um, and we and we do that. We we keep that juice flowing by constantly challenging ourselves, by looking around, by bringing in new talent when we can, by contracting with designers to work with us or photographers. And we're very open to, you know, I always say the best idea wins. It doesn't matter where it comes from, and it certainly doesn't need to come from me, or or our design team. If there's somebody else who has the germ of an idea, then we can help to translate that. Um, but we do that, you know, from nine to six, and um, then go home and have and have lives. It's really it's really nice. You know, we don't it get bonuses. We don't. You, proved, you proved it can be done. <laughs> so you you certainly mastered the use of of bold color and bold statements and and the less is more uh, theme. Um, and I have a question on who was your high level? Who was your highest level sponsor? Um, that was Matt. When I interviewed for this job, I, I loved being at the design firm I was at, um, and he was talking about all the things that actually came to pass, but none of them had come to pass yet. I was going to be the first creative director. I was inheriting a very small team, um, some of whom eventually left because they didn't feel that they wanted to be with the new or they were maybe concerned about whether they could they could do it, and that gave us the ability to hire. But at, the po at that point, none of this had happened. And he was talking about we're going to be able to do this, and we're going to be in house, and we're going to we're going to have an ad agency and a PR firm and all this. And I said, and he said, I want to I want to not only do the best creative work in public transportation, I want to do creative work that would stack up against what you know award-winning firms are doing out there for hire. And I said, that's great. What a great idea. Um, how's that going to happen? You know, um, who is going to you know I will be somewhere in the middle of a, an org chart that I don't even like to look at. Um, and how is I, I need an angel? I need a sponsor. How's that going to happen? And he said, "That's my job. That is my job is to um, find the money, uh, open up the, the the workflow a little bit, um, and get people to come on board in that way." And he did. You need somebody in the C-suite, you know. And what came to pass after that was that the chief executive officer became, you know, a fan. And we would see him in the elevator and say, "Hey, did you win any awards today?" Or I, you know, I saw that uh, billboard. I love that. And the the level of support just kept increasing um, from there. And so, do you have any suggestions? I know you talked about this uh, through the presentation, but if you have to give like two top suggestions for overcoming internal agency uh, norms uh, you know, and breaking through that mold, what what would they be? The first thing would be to surprise people. 
if you deliver work that fits right in with the internal agency norm, then you you're not breaking the mold. You're just you know cookie cutting the way your agency has always done it. And you are creative people. That's your job. Your job is to be creative. Your job is to be surprising. If you surprise your clients, chances are you're going to turn right around with that work once they get behind it and surprise your public, your audience. And that's really what you want to do because we're all busy, you know. Um, and there are and there are impression upon impression and clutter and there's so much to look at and see and it's coming at us now in the modern day that is it's never been like this before. And you need to surprise in order to gain attention. The second thing I would say is um, you need to, as I said, open that kimono a little bit and invite your clients in. You can never treat your clients as if they don't know what they're doing. You can never treat them as if they're not going to contribute. You, you have to make them a part of your creative team from the first. You're going to end up doing the work. You're going to refine the color, the type, the photography, the imagery, the, you know, all of that. But they, it's, it, it's their project that you're working on, and they are an expert. And so you need to bring them in, understand their pain point, what they're after, what they're trying to communicate, and come back delivering on that information but delivering in a surprising way. And watch what happens. People get excited. They, it's like they drink the Kool-Aid that you're offering up, and then they defend it and they stand behind the work, which is really important. Right. And how often do you actually compete against external agencies? And, and what does that look like when you have to go up against them? Um, we don't much anymore. Um, what it looked like before, as I said, is we didn't actually know we were competing. We just weren't getting the work um, or we'd be asked to fix something. We work with external agencies now, but the difference in the paradigm shift is that we are the lead. The, the communications group and the design studio, by extension, are the lead, and we can't do everything ourselves. We don't have capability to churn out video upon video. Um, there are things that we need help with because we have, you know, we do about 2,500 different projects a year, and we can't do every one. So now what we're doing is deputizing these outside agencies. The relationship is different. And what it is is us being the creative lead and saying, okay, we're really happy to have you as a partner. You bring your own experience. You bring your own resources. Here's what we're after as an idea, as a, as a communication of service or a program. And, um, you know, we let them, we, we, we give them some of our brand standards. We, we steep them in all the work you've just seen. And we say, now, go out and be the voice of Metro, but you're coming back to us with your first work, and everything is going to be directed by us. And so we're adding extra hands to the process, and we're adding extra minds, which is even more important. And these, these are good, good agencies, but we make sure they understand that we are the creative lead, and we will make sure that we adjust whatever product they come back with to be part of our um, voice. Okay, and that's a great segue into our next and last question. Um, it sounds as though somebody here is trying to overcome perception. So what she says are your best practices for transitioning the graphics department to the design studio in government? Well, you know, I can only imagine what the perceptions are that, that you, you know, maybe that you, your work is not as good as outside work or you can't deliver, you know, on, on the scope of what's needed, something like that. You have to win people on an interpersonal level. First of all, you have to establish some trust. You have to be able to demonstrate through your work or the work you want to do for them that you, um, that you can deliver. Um, you know, you, and then you have to deliver. You know, uh, people that are working in a design agency in the real world have very real deadlines because a product is launching, an ad campaign has to go up, whatever it is, and they have to deliver. That's why they work till midnight sometimes. Um, if that's what it takes for you to deliver the first time, you know, do it. But you've got to deliver because you have that one chance with a new client or somebody that you, who you're trying to change their mind. You've got to deliver really interesting work. It's got to be um, potent and it's got to be on point in terms of information and work, deliver what they need done. But, but again, be surprising and loosen yourself up and, you know, start with that blank slate, not necessarily their idea, 
if they have one, but the germ of their idea or what they're trying to do with that idea come back in different ways. Um, but but when I say deliver, one of the things I mean is that you can't come back with something that's really groovy in a, from a design point of view but doesn't get the work done. You know, you've got to be based in the reality. They have to see you as an intelligent, you know, uh, professional who understands what is needed rather than the kind of, uh, you know, airy-fairy designer that we sometimes have that perception to overcome. And you can't make your argument about, but I love red or, you know, this typeface works better. It has to be about the content. Um, and I can tell how passionate you are about this. So passion is is driving all of that, no doubt. Yes, definitely. It, it, you've got to make it fun for yourself. If you're not enjoying it, um, you won't have that passion. You'll get sucked into the all of that, you know, I work for a government agency kind of thing. And it, that could have easily been the way it happened here at Metro. You know, there are certainly departments that that – feel more like a Terry Gilliam movie sometimes than, you know, than, than what we're doing. But we work with them, and we, we help to elevate them, and we give them some fun to share with their team as well. Well, Michael Lejeune, you are a superstar. I have to thank you so much for sticking with us through our technical difficulties today. You've been wonderful and shared some really great information with us. Your work is really first class, and um, it's been a pleasure to have you as our guest speaker today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure too, Vicki. And um, I also want to thank Aquant Federal for sponsoring the webcast. Uh, we will have another webcast coming up next week, and that's um, based on video. So uh, look out for an invitation on that. Most of all, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, this uh, content will be posted up um, on ReadyTalk and uh, will be available. So if you enjoyed Michael's talk today, then you know, tell a friend, tell a colleague where they can find the link. I, I think uh, he gave some great tips and best practices today for us all to um, observe. So uh, thanks for being with us. Have a great rest of the week. I'm sorry we ran over today, but I did want to get your questions in. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Have a great week.